Presiding members, we will now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and I call on Mr. Tim Allister. We are aware an application for a proposed certificate of lawful use or development flood was submitted to Mid East Antrim Council on the 15th of September 2020. The application was submitted to confirm that the proposed development for the Northern Ireland point of entry at Lawrenport falls within the permitted development rights as set out in Planning General Permitted Development Order Northern Ireland 2015. Details of the application submitted in respect of Lawrenport are not in the public domain and therefore my officials are assessing this request under Environmental Information Regulations 2004 and will respond in due course. Jim Allister, supplementary. Well, it's not only the planning application that the public can't see. There was a letter from DERA, which the Minister says gave him instructions on these matters. There's a business plan which has been submitted, and none of those are uh, available to the public or to MLAs. Is the, I understand the desire of the Minister to blame officials, blame the Department in Westminster, to salve his unionist conscience, but is he not in danger of becoming the minister who provides the infrastructure for an Irish sea border? Is not what really is happening? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not blaming officials for anything. The officials are doing a job that they're tasked to do, uh, and that is their role. But if Mr. Alistair wants to apportion blame um, for this happening, he, he should turn to the government that he wishes all of Northern Ireland to be governed from, and that's the Westminster government. And Brandon Lewis says uh, that there's been checks in place since the 19th century, and the government would work to deliver in a way that works for Northern Ireland, but we are delivering on that, and uh, there's going to be checks on SPS, and that's, that's the, the UK government's view. Mr Allister is a, a keen supporter uh, that we move to a Westminster government, and we don't have government here this is a Westminster imposed solution um, to an Irish problem on Northern Ireland. We are the people who will suffer as a consequence of this imposed solution. I and him and the rest of the people in Northern Ireland alike. But it is not of our making, it is not of our doing. And no matter what somersaults Mr. Allister uh, takes, he is not going to prove that to be the case because it isn't the case. I call Patsy McLone. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for his answers there, and he, he's leading me nicely on to, to my question, which is what are, in fact, the implications for the Department, the Executive uh, of the Infrastructure and, indeed, wider trade of the Infrastructure at Larne not being ready by the end of what we hope will be a transition period? Well, that remains to be seen, um, because it's not the only thing that won't be ready. Um, the, the computer system, which is IT system, which is um, critically important, uh, which has been led by DEFRA, I don't believe will be ready either. And there is a number of things which will not be ready. Uh, so a decision will be taken at that point. But I would imagine that the European Union, who have indicated how much they love Northern Ireland, will hardly want to starve the people of Northern Ireland when it comes to the 1st of January. I call on Tagna Megalier. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the recent uh, programme assurance review into the transition had uh, given it a uh, status red and a need of urgent intervention. Given that our east-west trade in agri food is in the region of um, food and drink is in the region of about four billion a year, what assurances can he uh, put in place? What guarantees can he give that systems will be put in place so that trade, unfettered trade, can continue uh, from the first of January? Thank you. Well, we have worked closely with the UK government. We have indicated to them over and over again that unfettered access is something which is critical. Some people thought that only unfettered access was important north and south. We never had a fa in fact counted uh, for a fraction of the trade that takes place east and west. Uh, so it's hugely unfortunate that we're in a circumstance where people actually paid attention uh, to those who, who said that we could have nothing north and south and it's much easier to do everything east-west, because it is going to have a greater distortion on trade as a consequence of that. And whilst um, the UK government have made it clear that trade between Northern Ireland and GB uh, will be unfettered, and the EU haven't accepted that, by the way, and the EU need to back off and accept the fact 
that if Britain wants to accept goods from Northern Ireland unfettered, they can butt out. Uh, but Northern Ireland needs to be getting the most minimal, the most minimal um, checks possible in terms of goods coming from GB. And the EU needs to ensure that that happens and that the people of Northern Ireland are not hurt as a consequence of their horse trading deals that they're engaged in. Well, Roy, Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> the Minister referred to previous inspections. Yes, there were inspections on live animals, but there is to be considerably more inspections following the encouragement of a regulatory border down the RIC from his party. So would he confirm that some 12 additional environmental health officers are currently being recruited? Who will be paying for them? And what, where will they, be, that will they be potentially inspecting products coming to Northern Ireland? And what will be the cost implication and the cost of delays to food coming to our supermarket shelves? Well, uh, there's an attempt by the member to, to rewrite history, and I would ask him to turn to the parliamentary Hansard, which will record every vote that takes place at Westminster and identify once uh, where the DUP supported anything that he suggested, and he'll find that factually he is totally incorrect. In terms of the, the people who are employed, um, there are £6 million uh, being provided by Westminster um, for issues which are over and above the capital infrastructure. Mark Dorgan not being in his place and moving on to Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, uh, question number three, please. I have been very clear that all trade agreements, including that with the United States of America, must uphold the current high standards relating to food safety in the UK, and all imported products must meet these standards. I have therefore written to the DEFRA Secretary of State on this matter and will continue to make representations as the negotiations pro progress. I have received a response providing reassurance that legal protections for UK standards remain in place, and the UK Government is committed not to compromise on standards and trade agreements. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in light of your answer, thank you very much, Minister. But uh, is this Department made aware of our assessment of the impact on the Northern Irish producers of the lowering of food safety standards for meat and poultry imported into the GB market, knowing of the high standards that we have here in Northern Ireland? I thank the member for the question. There are a couple of issues arising from that there. The GB market is, is hugely important for our produce, um, taking over 50 per cent of it. Uh, so uh, produce which comes in a, of a lower standard would be of concern to us. I have received correspondence from Liz Truss, who is leading on this, um, that they will not be taking chlorinated chicken, nor indeed will they be taking hormone beef. Now, that is their position. I trust that they will stick to that position, and that will not change. Uh, but that is a matter for them, and we will keep the pressure that that should not change. I, I would believe that the consumer, and the consumer is king, uh, will probably resist the acquisition of such products um, when it comes to the shops. And then it comes to the, 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 the food trade and whether we can maintain uh, the standard there. And that's, that's the area that, that concerns me most, because people when they go out to a cafe or a restaurant they tend not to ask where the food comes from. So if there was a trade agreement that allowed such, such food to come in, I think it would be more of a challenge um, in the food service sector as opposed to um, the, the retail trade. But our target must be to ensure that the food that comes in uh, to the United Kingdom beyond, uh, beyond Brexit is food that meets the current standards that is used in the United Kingdom, which is a very high standard. Call Stuart Dixon. Minister, would you eat chlorinated chicken or hormone-infested beef? And is that what you would recommend to your constituents should the United Kingdom lower its uh, food standards? Um, it's not what I'd recommend, but I've been, I've been in America, and I assume I probably have eaten chlorinated chicken and hormone beef, as probably anybody else who's been in the United States of America has. Well, Steve Egan. Indeed, may I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, one of the things that I would like the Minister to comment on Will he seek to introduce food labelling to all products that are being imported into Northern Ireland to demonstrate that Northern Ireland food in itself is of a much better standard and we are able, therefore, to quantify to our consumers that eating Northern Ireland and British food is, in fact, best? Well, there already is extensive food labelling and it is a, a matter that we are continuing to engage with the Food Standards Agency on in terms of, of food labelling going forward. 
I would say this, that it is my desire that Northern Ireland product, which is already exceptionally high, is something that we can have the highest standards on in terms of provenance, traceability, animal health, animal welfare and environmental standards. And I think if we can do that, we can sell brand Northern Ireland food right across not just UK, Europe, but the entire world as being something which is a Rolls Royce of food produce. And consequently, we need to concern ourselves less at that stage uh, with cheap imports because the public will know if they buy something with brand Northern Ireland on it, that they're buying something uh, which is of the highest standards in every aspect of its production. Call John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, in an answer to a previous question, you said that you trust the, the current ministers who are involved in these negotiations. What gives you grounds to trust uh, the officials or ministers involved in these negotiations around U.S. imports or anyone else? I, I think the member may have picked up something slightly wrong. I did not mention trust. I mentioned trust, who is a minister negotiating. I don't trust, trust an awful lot of people, so I'm very cautious about that. But, so I can assure you that I do not necessarily trust those people who, who are negotiating on our behalf, because we've been let down too many times before. Uh, but I am pressing upon them that we want the same high standards uh, to exist post-Brexit as currently exist. And I call John Blair. Speaker, question number four. Uh, firstly, I must state that the best way to deal with our waste is to prevent it from being created in the first place. Following the principles of the waste hierarchy, then, where waste cannot be prevented, our resources should be reused. And where resources cannot be reused, we should then seek to reduce a high quality recycle it, which is put back into Northern Ireland's economy where possible. It is, however, inevitable, after all of that, that for the foreseeable future, some waste will be sent for residual waste treatment energy from waste or deed landfill. The recent consultation is the first stage of the policy development process, which will allow us to consider the views and evidence from all stakeholders and make informed decisions in relation to the future of recycling and separate collection of waste. Alongside this, I am also considering the future waste infrastructure needs for Northern Ireland to consider the totality of waste recycling and disposal as no element can be considered in isolation. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that and, and for previous answers. Waste incinerators, Mr Speaker, have been measured as an expensive method of generating energy and also of, of handling waste. Can I ask the Minister for his Department's assessment of the economic burden the proposed high tide incinerator would have on local councils and their environmental services capacity? Well, obviously, R21 are, have negotiated for um, energy from waste um, in the form of incineration, and the cost of that is, is well in excess of £200 million um, for the actual um, construction, and then there will be running costs thereafter. And uh, ARC 21 are making the argument that financially that stacks up. Uh, I should say that when it comes to waste, uh, number one, we want to reduce the amount of waste that we produce in the first instance. In particular, reduce the amount of, of plastics, and we will be doing work to ensure that that's the case. Uh, but secondly, we want to further recycling. So, whenever I was DOE Minister back in 2010, um, we brought out our policies then and indicated that by 2020 we wanted to achieve 50% recycling rates. That was against the background of um, Belfast and, and at that time Derry City Council having recycling rates of in the low 20s, um, some of the other councils in the higher 20s. Uh, and we achieved that 50 per cent. Now we are looking, going forward to 2035, sorry Mr Speaker for my back being on you, and now, now we look forward to 2035 um, to a situation where we are looking to go to 65 per cent, and that, that will be in legislation, in UK legislation. I would like you to actually push it further to 70 per cent, if that was possible, and then you are left with, with what, what is there thereafter. And I think it is important that Whatever decision is made, and I don't want to impinge upon any decisions that are made, but whatever decision is made takes into account that our first priority is to recycle as much waste as possible, and that we would leave as little as possible for that residual um, um, RFD. And, and that is important that we do that to ensure that we absolutely minimise um, the waste uh, that is that has gone into that sector. Call Philip McGuigan. 
No, good. Uh, Ken Collier, uh, I thank the Minister for, for answer uh, so far, and I was going to ask him uh, about uh, new uh, recycling targets, and I'm glad that he, he is saying that he plans to have targets of 75 per cent. So, given that he's answered the question I was going to ask, he did say uh, that reducing waste uh, was, was the most important aspect of, of this, and he said that they were doing, the Department was doing some work on plastics. Perhaps he could give us some detail on that work. Well, in terms of we, we do hope um, to bring FUMP forward uh, 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 as, 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 as the time goes forward. But in terms of plastics, um, there is an evident need to reduce the amount of plastic that, that, that is going into the system. And we have engaged um, with, with the sector to look at how we can further reduce that. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, the, the, the deposit uh, regime, where uh, those plastics which are sold out into the system, uh, for example, for soft drinks, uh, will come back and, and be recycled once again. Uh, but we are also looking at the whole issue of packaging to actually reduce the amount of plastic that goes into packaging. Um, and we're working with, with, with businesses and companies um, uh, and hearing from them on how they can develop alternatives. And there are a series of alternative products out there, eucalyptus, for example, uh, being one uh, where people are looking at other kinds of packaging, uh, which would be much, do, do considerably less damage to the environment um, and are serious alternatives to what is currently existing. Well, Carol Hunter. Mr. Speaker, uh, and I thank uh, the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, referring to Mr. Blair's question, can I ask, when does the Minister expect to bring forward new policies informed by the responses to the consultation? Thank you. In terms of what we're doing, um, there's a lot of policy being set at the minute, and uh, we would hope to, to be doing consultations on a, on a series of programmes over the course of the next number of, of months. Uh, when it comes to the waste recycling, uh, part of the legislation that is going through Westminster, uh, they have been working with ourselves, and the 65 per cent target for recycling is going into the Westminster legislation as a legally binding target. I, I, I wasn't that happy because I wanted to go to 70 per cent, um, but we can still have a target of 70 per cent, but in the Westminster legislation it will be 65 per cent. Um, so we will continue to work um, towards achieving the highest rates possible, um, which, which we believe is achievable, and that's important. Um, some people questioned whether the 50 per cent was achievable 10 years ago. We've done that. Uh, some people thought that it would be a struggle for us to reach 20 per cent renewable energy uh, 10 years ago. We doubled that. We're at over 40 per cent. Uh, so I believe that the 70 per cent from uh, the, the hunger that there is in, in the industry uh, to actually do the right thing. I believe that this 70% is achievable, and I believe that the public will respond to that. I call Sean Lynch. Yes, ever question five. In common with the UK government, I am clear that the Northern Ireland Protocol needs to be implemented in a way that minimises any frictions on the flow of agri-food trade and does not increase costs for our businesses and people living in Northern Ireland. I am working on the assumption that if both the EU and United Kingdom governments are committed to minimising friction on trade, it is reasonable to assume that there will be a very small number of checks. In that respect, my officials are working to minimise the need for infrastructure as the SPS operational programme delivery is progressed. The following details provide a brief update. A business case for the necessary work has been forwarded by officials to the Department of Finance and Her Majesty's Treasury. This includes building work, additional staff and IT functions, and funding has been secured for some £43 million, of which £37 million relates to capital expenditure, and a further £6 million will also be required for recruiting training and employing additional personnel and programme implementation costs. As you know, <coughs> the proposed flood applications have been submitted to all the relevant councils for development of the proposed points of entry for Northern Ireland seaports. This includes applications to Derry City and Strabane District Council, Newry Morn and Dist Down District Council, Belfast City Council and Mid and East Antrim Borough Council. The applications seek to confirm that the proposed developments fall within permitted development rights as set out in the Planning General Permitted Development Order in Northern Ireland 2015. 
No determinations have been received to date. The team have initiated the tender process for the design and build phase for the required inspection facilities in line with the programme procurement strategy, which was agreed with the Department of Finance. The contract award letters for the design and build of the proposed inspection facilities at Warren Point, Larne and Belfast Harbours were issued to successful contractors on 7 October 2020. Meetings with successful contractors will follow in the coming weeks to agree the delivery timelines for the design and build programme of works. Work also continues with the initial ground survey work being undertaken for each of the seaport sites, Belfast Harbour, Larnport, Warren Point Port and Foilport, in order to inform the forthcoming detailed design process. And over the coming months, to ensure businesses are kept up to date, a communication and engagement plan will be implemented. This will include a series of stakeholder engagement sessions to guide traders step by step through the journey from GB to Northern Ireland. Sean Lynch, supplementary. The Minister has answered part of my um, question in terms of engagement with ports and ferries, but can I ask them what engagement his department is having with industry haulage to minimise the disruption before the end of the transition period? Well, as I indicated in the tail of the question, there that we um, will be indicating or will, we will be engaging uh, extensively uh, with industry and uh, that we will be uh, communicating with them um, with the engagement plan and how that will be implemented. There are still ongoing negotiations between the UK and EU, and therefore some of the issues um, are still outstanding. It is important that the haulage industry uh, is uh, allowed to function as smoothly and seamlessly as possible, and that is uh, what we will be seeking to do in everything um, that we set out to do uh, to ensure that um, things which are currently seamless remain as seamless as possible um, in the new uh, scenario. Bradley. Speaker, um, from the Minister's answer, I think it is fair to, to say that delays in our supply chain are an outcome, an inevitable outcome of Brexit. And he has mentioned stakeholder engagements. I have spoken with hauliers who are still very much in the dark. Been, they do not know what systems they need to invest in, and they do not know what those costs are. Can the Minister throw any light on that specific um, request? Thank you. Uh, the member is half right. To, uh, if, if delays um, are to happen, um, they will happen as a result of the protocol, not because of Brexit. And the protocol that people cried out for and said it was wonderful, and then all of a sudden they realised that it's not so wonderful. In terms of the haulage sector, I recognise that they need more information than they currently have. I'm not in a position to give that them, them that information at this moment. Um, because of the ongoing negotiations that are taking place. Of course, the minister who has responsibility for haulage is the Minister for Infrastructure. And I welcome the fact that after months and months and months, uh, we are now uh, looking at a scheme which will support the haulage industry um, who kept going throughout COVID uh, but had very difficult circumstances to do that. Uh, and that scheme was delayed and delayed because no minister would take it on. And I welcome the fact that the infrastructure minister is now doing that. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, minister, uh, have you had any discussions with your counterparts in London regarding what protections you, uh, will be given to ensure that NI goods do not face competitive disadvantage or discrimination when placed on the market in GB after Brexit? Yes, that has is, that is been extensive. And there is an extensive paper trail of, of letters going back and forward. Uh, I have engaged with the interministerial group at every session of it. Um, I have engaged directly um, with my counterparts um, in the UK government. So there has been an extensive engagement, and throughout, um, the UK government has maintained that there should be unfettered access uh, between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. I would like to see it unfettered access both ways. I have fought and argued uh, for that. Unfortunately, the protocol mitigates against that. Uh, but in terms of goods going from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, uh, we should have unfettered access. There is one caveat I should, I should add, however, and that is Northern Ireland cannot become a back door for goods uh, coming from other places entering the Republic of Ireland and ending up in the Great Britain market. Uh, because then we have become um, uh, almost like a, what Albania was at one stage um, in, in Europe. 
uh, where it was a place where, where goods could come in uh, and be transited to, to other places. We need to ensure that the integrity of our food system is retained. And for that reason, um, the, the suggested six months uh, free-for-all, um, which, which the UK government seemed to be inclined to go to, is something that I'm fighting. And I trust that all of the executive uh, will adopt the same position and that it will come very clear to the UK government that we need to ensure that there is no backdoor opportunities um, through Northern Ireland uh, for goods which would be of a lesser standard. And I call Keith Buchanan. Your question six, please. My department <coughs> currently supports a range of funding programmes that assist rural communities. The Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme 2014-20 uh, funded leader in rural tourism schemes. And that will make available £11 million this year to support investment in rural businesses, villages and basic services. The Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Tripsy Programme will provide £10 million this year across 20 initiatives aimed at tackling social isolation, access and financial poverty, as well as supporting COVID-19 recovery in rural communities. A further £2.5 million is available to support pilot projects that address rural issues emerging from the draft rural policy framework and the need to respond to COVID-19. DERA also continues to monitor and support the implementation of the Rural Needs Act, Northern Ireland 2016, by government departments, public bodies and local councils, which provides an effective mechanism in supporting the delivery of positive and meaningful benefit for rural dwellers. Call Keith Cannon, supplementary. Thank you. Thanks, uh, the Minister, so far for his answer. Just with respect, uh, Minister, some of those programmes, um, the process can be obviously complex, difficult, which in cases it does need to be. But can the Minister look into what he can do to make the, remove the red tape in some of those programmes, which can be fairly long? You know, thank the member for the question. My officials have reviewed some of the processes around the current programme and have started to revise certain procedures to reduce red tape and make the application process more efficient within the context of managing public money and the audit responsibilities that come with that. And it's something that I'll continue to drive home with them, the necessity to make things um, as practical as possible so that people can provide all of the information that needs to be provided uh, without wading through 40 pages of documentation uh, you know, to, to, to draw down relatively small amounts of money in some instances. Call Emma Sheeran. Gormaget, thank Corley. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, as a consequence of Brexit, we are now losing uh, the rural development programme that you mentioned there. What has the Department planned to replace this programme and how is it going to be funded given that the substantial bulk of the, the funding thus far came from the EU? Well, the, the funding um, that you're referring to is funding which uh, it will be replacement funding um, directly from the UK government, so that, that, that will be the source of future funding for, for rural communities. I call uh, Trevor Clark. You may not get a something from you, Trevor. Uh, question number seven. The history of working with local councils to help them make sure as many of the resources are as possible are diverted from landfill. And following the principles of the waste hierarchy, DEIR has undertaken a number of initiatives involving local councils to prevent waste from being generated in the first instance as part of the waste prevention programme. Reuse projects have been provided with funding, <clears throat> notably the newly launched Northern Ireland Resource Network, which brings together a range of stakeholders, including local councils, to provide support and guidance in promoting reuse and repair. Since the introduction of the food waste regulations in 2015, over 1 million tonnes of biodegradable waste have been diverted from landfill. Separate collection of food waste has also positively impacted the levels and quality of waste recycling. As a result of collaborative working between my department and councils, Northern Ireland has reached the EU a Northern Ireland Waste Management Strategy recycling target of 50 per cent ahead of schedule. Building on this success, the current £23 million Household Waste Collaborative Change Programme financially supports councils to further increase recycling rates, improve the quality of recycling and reducing reliance on landfill. Financial support has been accompanied by my department's work alongside the Northern Ireland National Communications Action Plan, which has resulted in a common approach to communications and behavioural change campaigns in Northern Ireland, ensuring that important recycling message messaging is delivered to all residents. And this has yielded very positive results, but my department will continue to build upon this. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to topical.
questions, and there will be 15 minutes for that. And I now call on Colm Gillernew. Can the Minister provide an update on securing the replacement of European Union funding? Yes, uh, considerable work has, has been went on uh, in reference to that, and the uh, UK Government uh, will be providing uh, replacement funding. It has been indicated throughout um, that they will supply uh, the same funding uh, uh, as, as is currently the, the case um, through, through their, their party manifesto. And again, uh, it is a matter for us to seek to, to hold them to that and to seek to ensure uh, that that is the case. Um, that has been the case. Um, uh, however, we are in a circumstance where COVID-19 is inflicting huge damage upon the Treasury. Um, the cost to the Treasury is mounting all of the time. Uh, so there is uh, significant pressures there, and one uh, can always or can never be absolutely sure, so we always need to be acute uh, to these things. Supplementary. So, um, given that uncertainty, what assurances can the Minister give that the replacement funding will, in fact, be secured? Well, what I will say is that um, we have no guarantees, if we had been in the European Union, of having the same funding as we had previously, uh, because they are going into a round of negotiations, and in that round of negotiations, the accession countries, um, who were treated less favourably um, than the existing EU countries, um, will be treated the same going forward. Um, so that means that governments will either have to invest more, and those will be governments who face the same troubles as the UK government uh, in terms of supporting uh, their country through COVID-19, um, or indeed that cake will be made smaller, and then each country will have less money to give to their people. So there's no guarantees in any of this, but we have a, a, a commitment made in this government's manifesto that they will maintain um, the current spending, and that's something which we will seek to hold them to. I would say that question five has been withdrawn, and I now move to Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, would the Minister join with me in congratulating Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council Parks team and Lisburn BMX Club on achieving six green flags today with Keep Northern Ireland uh, beautiful. Uh, with Bells Lane and Lopman's BMX track, Billy Neal Park, Moat Park, Moira de Main Wallace Park, and that very beautiful Castle Gardens, uh, that well known uh, green space just above us there, on their high quality green spaces. I can uh, remember, and Mr. Butler would have been young at the time, uh, and I was all on the council. I was, rel I was relatively young, I suppose, uh, at that stage of. of, of helping secure the funding for the Castle Gardens project, and it is a fantastic project. And uh, Lisburn and Castlereagh Parks team have been exemplary over the years, and some of their uh, floral tributes have been recognised um, at a national, indeed, an international level. Uh, so the Parks team are excellent, and I thank the member uh, for bringing them to the House today and, and raising this issue, uh, because it demonstrates the importance of our local government uh, sector and the high quality work that is carried out uh, by councils, not just Lisburn and Castlereagh, but by many councils across Northern Ireland. Robbie Butler, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer, in particular his uh, support towards financing these when he was at Lisburn City Council. And could he give a further commitment from his department to ensure groups like Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and the councils will be uh, supported financially from his department to continue this good work? Yes, uh, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful have an important role. I worked very extensively with them previously, and uh, I'm happy to, to work with them once again. Uh, you know, we have a beautiful country in so many ways. We've got the most wonderful coastlines, um, superb mountain ranges, and you know, Northern Ireland um, ch ch changes all of the time. So, county down, you can have so many different things, uh, whether it be um, in round Ross Trevor and, and Warren Point and, and, and that beauty down there in Carlingford or whether it's up at Strangford or indeed Sleeve Creek, it doesn't matter. Um, and you go into the various counties and, and, and you, could, you could go over it. And it's important, given the beautiful landscape that we have, that we as human beings um, do as little as possible to despoil that landscape. And one way of, 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 of helping um, keep the, the beauty, of, beauty of our country is to ensure that we, we do keep things tidy. 
and we don't throw litter, and, and we have a regime that, that, that picks up. And I will say this, some people really need to, get, to, to, to learn to take their litter home with them and take their waste home with them. If it wasn't there when, when, when they arrived, it shouldn't be there when they leave. I call Emma Rogan. Minister, a recent report from Greenpeace showed that super trawlers massively stepped up their activities during the pandemic lockdown. What measures have you put in place to effectively monitor super trawlers that may enter our waters? Well, um, they shouldn't be entering our waters because, <coughs> in, in most instances, uh, instances, it is our own fish, fish, fishing boats that, that are out there, and indeed Irish fishing boats. But the super trawlers tend not to come into the Irish sea box so much uh, because of the nature of the fishing. And there's more nephrops, uh, and, and it doesn't lend itself to, to the super trawlers that would exist, for example, in the west of Ireland or in the North Sea. I should say that exiting the, the European Union will assist us on this, in that the waters will be ours, and therefore the fishing will be dispensed um, by our own government and by, by, by this administration here. And therefore the 20% uh, that was left to France, which they didn't actually utilize, but, but they took it off our fishermen anyway, that the EU very generously allowed uh, French fishermen uh, to come to Northern Ireland uh, will no longer be available, uh, and that's something uh, which I think we'll all view very positively. Emma Rogan, supplementary. Given um, your contribution about the damage caused um, by super trawlers recently during the fisheries bill debate, um, will the Minister and I commit to doing all in, in your power to see super trawlers banned from our waters? Well, as I indicated, super trawlers are not something which will, ex will fish extensively in the RIC. We are not responsible for, for the, the areas where they are operating extensively, and that would be off the west coast of Ireland, it would be in the North Sea, it would be in the Bay of Biscay, because for some reason, um, uh, uh, in the Cod Recovery Programme, uh, Northern Ireland fishermen um, couldn't fish in the RIC for cod. Um, only a very, very limited tonnage. And the cod naturally progress um, north to south. And the super trawlers were waiting in the Bay of Biscay uh, with the French and the Spanish super trawlers catching considerable amounts of cod. So let's, let's be very sensible with these things. We haven't seen a cod recovery program uh, because of those boats in, in, the, in, in, the, in the Celtic Sea um, and in the Bay of Biscay. Uh, and it's important that as we go forward um, that we have much better and much more practical solutions that actually aid the fishermen uh, and, and South Down in the Maine and in Strangford um, who are out there in those waters trying to make a living in very difficult circumstances. Well, <coughs> um, the Minister will be aware that in August 2017, uh, severe landslides devastated uh, the Dlenelli Valley and other parts of the Sperrins in the hinterland. And I know that he has been deliberating on a scheme to support some of those farmers who are still carrying the severe burden of this. I wonder if you give us an update, uh, update on his current thinking in relation to a support scheme for those uh, farm families. Thank you. I recognise um, the desperately difficult circumstances uh, that the people uh, in Glen Ely found themselves in as a consequence of um, the, the, the flooding that took place, um, the landslides that were involved, the damage that was done to, to, to their land, uh, the amount of debris that was left that had to be cleared with diggers, fences taken out. And therefore, um, you know, I, I have spoken to my officials um, on this matter. Uh, it is one that um, I've indicated before, I, I will have to take a ministerial direction, um, but I, I, have, I want officials to do as much work as possible um, to, to bring forward uh, the case to me, uh, so that if I do choose to go down that particular route of, of supporting it, it's as robust as, uh, as we can make it. I'm glad that the Minister is still deliberating on this, and certainly I can't emphasise the sense of 
feeling that there is for farmers in that region because on the same uh, the climate, the same flood on that particular night uh, the farmers in Inish Owen were similarly impacted and they have received their funding some years ago. So to, uh, I take this opportunity to encourage the Minister to um, continue and conclude his deliberations and certainly look in a positive light to support these farmers at the earliest opportunity. Thank you. There, there has been some support has been offered um, but I understand uh, that the farmers you know, believe that, that there needs to be something which is of more significance, and therefore that's something that we need to, to come, bring those deliberations to a conclusion on one way or the other. Well, Pastor McLone. Um, could I ask the Minister just um, in relation to the provision of uh, the measures at, at Larne uh, for the protection of animals? and the likes. Does the Minister foresee any blockages at the Scottish side in terms of the flow of traffic? Well, certainly the Scots don't want there to be any blockages, and they've made that very clear, and they don't want there to be a, a, any uh, infrastructure at their harbours. Uh, where I do see potential blockages is, is Dublin Hollyhead, and uh, there is a lot of uh, food goes from Northern Ireland, and through that uh, route, uh, which ends up in the UK market, or the GB market rather. And <clears throat> I want to see a dedicated uh, Northern Ireland lane uh, at uh, Dublin Harbour, and uh, I would hope that Dublin would do the decent thing uh, when it comes to it, and, and as, as good neighbours, uh, help to facilitate that trade continuing, and that support for, for their ports, which uh, is coming from businesses here, and uh, I've also spoken to my Welsh counterparts uh, to ensure that lorries uh, travelling from the UK to Northern Ireland uh, via Holyhead uh, would have that facility where they would have immediate access onto the, the, the boat, um, as opposed to waiting in the queue with everybody else. Supplementary, Pastor McLean. I just want to thank the, the minister for his answer. Just that that had been raised by some who had presented to the committee on Thursday uh, from the ports. Uh, has the minister or the department done any scoping exercise off, off the ports to see where there might be potential uh, problems as we work through the uh, Brexit issues that, that are currently before us? Well, I have made it very clear that certainly for the Northern Ireland ports uh, that we are not to have any uh, blockages. Uh, and that is something which we have fought for and uh, provided the European Union um, doesn't behave in, in, in a very difficult way. Uh, we should have a situation in Northern Ireland uh, where most people won't notice any checks that are happening um, because it will be uh, perhaps one lorry per, per, per boat uh, which, is, which is getting a check um, and that check um, should last for around one hour. Um, so it shouldn't have a significant impact uh, moving forward. Uh, members, the time is up, and could I ask members just to take a raise for a moment or two to change the chamber arrangements for the next item on the order paper?